Howdy folks, it's Meandering Mike in the Man Cave of Madness. It's the middle of the afternoon and we're going to do our after action review of our playthrough of Quatre Bra. I uh, wish I was able to get to it a little sooner, but various life stuff got in the way. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the play of the game. We're going to talk a little bit about playing the game as a standalone scenario and a little bit of talk about the campaign game. Uh, so let's first get started with a reminder of what we did. We played the Cotterbra scenario standalone without using Day or Lawn's first core. So I don't know if you remember or not, but down here in the setup is part of Day or Lawn's first core. And these first turn reinforcements here are the remainder of Day or Lawn's first core. And those uh, really shouldn't be used in the standalone scenario. It's a, it's a, an optional rule to add them. Um, but uh, Darlon spent the day <laughs> marching up this road and heading over to Lini and then getting sent back. Uh, and so he basically marched the entire day and didn't get involved in combat at all. Uh, the other rule that we played with was the combined arms rule. Uh, that's where if you have in an attack at least one infantry unit, one cavalry unit, and one artillery unit all participating in the attack, that you get a one odd shift in your favor. Uh, that artillery could either be bombarding from two hexes away or it could be adjacent in the combat. Uh, we didn't play with any of the other options. There's like guards rules that they don't aren't really relevant to the Cotterbra scenario. That's quite relevant rule to uh, the Lini scenario and later on definitely in the, the Belle Alliance scenario. Um, but I highly recommend using the combined arms rule. Uh, as I mentioned in the playthrough or during that process that uh, you're gonna really get limited use of it in this particular scenario because the French only have two artillery units. So at most they'll ever only have two attacks per turn that could benefit. And the Anglo Allies only have two cavalry units. One of them's a little one strength guy, <laughs> start the word, and if he dies early, you know, <laughs> they got one reinforcement cavalry on the first turn. But that's it. So they don't necessarily have a lot of opportunity to use it either. Uh, lots of opportunity to use it in, say, the uh, Lini or the La Belle Alliance scenario. Um, but I definitely say go ahead and use it. I think it, it adds to the flavor of, of the Napoleonic era, thinking about the combined arms. Um, so in, in our playthrough... I don't know if you remember, one of the things that I stressed was that early on, the first two turns, Ney has to worry about the low, lower French morale. Now, French morale wasn't low per se, but this sort of models his uh, indecision and worry and uh, the, the, the French morale. Uh, if, if they exceed that, equal, equal or exceed that in losses... In, in that first two turns, the French lose immediately. So that's the thing to always remember that sometimes people miss that, that there's rule 13.2, uh, automatic victory. If the French army is demoralized, the opposing player achieves an automatic victory. Boom. Now, the Anglo allies are Prussian armies. In any scenario, they have to be disintegrated. So demoralization of the Anglo allies or Prussians does not lose them the game. It just makes them more ineffective. And remember the, the effect of being demoralized is you can't advance after combat. And that's whether you're victorious when attacking and advancing, or if the attacker attacks you and they fail, you're victorious, you can normally def uh, advance as the defender. If you're demoralized, you can't do that. Now, one, one little note uh, about the demoralization rules um, with, the, with the strength points that in the campaign game, it's different because you count it by core. Each core in the game has a demoralization level. And 
reaching that demoralization level means that core is suffering the penalty uh, of not being able to advance after combat. And it's possible uh, through the campaign rules that you can reorganize units that have been eliminated and get some back by taking the leader out of the action and putting them at least, I can't remember what it is, 10 squares or way farther from any enemy unit. And you can potentially get units back into the game and you could undemoralize a core. Um, there's some special rules for like the French if the guard get gets demoralized and that has an effect of other nearby ones and it can cause a trigger effect that can just basically make the uh the whole french army sort of collapse um so that's one thing to note that things are a little different in the campaign game and if you're thinking about ping the campaign i still highly recommend playing the individual scenarios first i, I highly recommend starting with this scenario then trying Lini. then go ahead and try wavra a lot of people do not like the wavra scenario but there's some interesting aspects to it. It's it's kind of puzzly in that, you know, you have a, a delaying action and trying to exit units off the board. And uh, it's sort of a, it's a mathematical puzzle sort of, um, but an interesting situation. That's, that's worth playing for the fun of it. Things will not work out <laughs> like they will historically in the campaign game. Highly unlikely, unless you add certain rules. There's certain freedoms in the campaign game where you can do things that are really ahistorical. Um, but one of the advantages of the campaign game is obviously you get to play out all three battles on both both halves. You're doing uh, Carabra and Lini at the same time. You could potentially shift leaders around on who's going to concentrate where. Um, and it, it makes for a lot of fun. There is some abuses possible in the command and control system in the campaign game, which I will talk about at a later time, but I, I will talk a little bit towards the end of this about how the game plays a lot differently using the command and control versus the standalone. Now, so in our game, again, I mentioned that the morale and the early morale of uh, consideration in Cotter Bra for those first two turns where the French demoralization level is only 10, you lose 10 strength points in the first two turns as the French, by any means, boom, it's over. <laughs> so our, our worry was being aggressive. If you're too aggressive and you get exchanges and you end up having to lose 10 strength points in those exchanges, you, you might like totally denude the ally of their ability to fight in that first turn. Like if you hit their 5-4 their brigade and their 4-4 four, four brigade and all of these with a one strength artillery and their one strength cavalry and whatever's going to come on the first turn, but if that happens, you're making change. Unless you didn't make change carefully, you might have lost ten points and you lose the game. Uh, so you got to be really careful about being too aggressive at the start, and it's through, through two turns, right? Not just the first turn. So it's even possible for the allies to counterattack maybe in the second turn and kill some French units. So even if you get one exchange, you might get bit and defeated in the second turn. So you have to be careful. You have to pay attention to that. And I've noticed a lot of playthroughs where people aren't really taking that into consideration as much as they should. Um, so one of the key aspects I'm going to talk about again here is remember the combat results table is bloodless. One to one, two to one, three to one. Attacker cannot lose anything even at one to two. At one to three, you can you only attack at one to three normally just to soak soak off to, to diversionary attack. Rarely are you actually trying to score the one six chance of getting the retreat. <laughs> Where all the other times you're gonna you're gonna retreat as the attacker or maybe eliminated. But up through three to one, you don't have any chance of losing anything as the attacker. Unless you're in a situation where you're attacking out of a situation where you're surprised, not surprised, <laughs> surrounded, and if you get the AR, you could kill yourself. But remember, you have to attack. If you're next to an enemy, you must attack all enemies that you're adjacent to. Those exchanges kick in at 4 to 1, but sort of the DE. So sometimes you're saying, hey, I'm hoping to get a DE on a guy, but you might get an exchange. Sometimes you're okay with it, but you got to watch out. you got to be careful. Um... But the key thing to remember is you may reduce these odds. And this is where the 4 to 1, 5 to 1, 6 to 1 versus the 3 to 1 sometimes come into play. Sometimes you don't want to risk those exchanges. 
You know, if, if you have a four to one odds and the enemy is surrounded, that guarantees you will kill them. Because either you're going to DE them or exchange and they're going to die, but you'll lose something on the exchange, or they'll retreat and if they're surrounded, they're going to die. If you attack at three to one, you may fail on a six. But if you want to make sure you do not lose anything, reduce to three to one instead of four to one if they're surrounded. Increasing the odds up to five to one increases your chance of a DE going up six to one even more. But at five to one and six to one, you have two chances of getting an exchange. This is really bloody here. And so if you really outnumber a small guy and you're attacking with a bunch of big dudes, watch out. It may not be worth it unless you can throw in a little guy. So like the the French do have, you know, a 4-7 caliber, two four sevens and a 5-6 and a 4-6. And we don't. They don't want to. They don't want to give up their two six horse artillery. But you you might be willing, you know, to exchange off a a four strength cavalry. Um, you certainly don't want to lose a, like a. Oops. I am not pointing at the right spot. Sorry, folks. I'm, I'm pointing at the the on printed on map. I don't have the extra counters here, but. Um, so so th think about that. This is this is key to a lot of the calculation and tactics is thinking about the odds, thinking about if you have them surrounded, are you going to try to surround them? At what odds do you do? Do you do multiple low to medium you know, strength attacks to try to get us around and avoid the exchanges? And at certain times, like certainly once turn three comes around and the French demoralization level jumps all the way up to, I believe from 10 it goes up to 30 or 35... I should have that memorized, but I do not. Uh, 25, 25. So it goes up two and a half times. You may want to be a little more aggressive and willing to, to lose certain you know, units if it is helping you dominate in a certain sector, blow a hole in the line, um, you know, kill some critical uh, Anglo ally. Like, for example, if you can kill all the Anglo allied cavalry, they won't be able to get any more uh, combined arm shifts. And so you might be willing to say, hey, I'm going to kill that other last little two-strength cavalry. You might attack it at larger odds and be willing to lose, you know, a four or five-strength unit to kill the two-strength unit, but to say, ha, I've eliminated their cavalry and they can no longer get combined arms. Um, in our particular game... Ney was aggressive. He 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 managed to to get an exchange, and then then he had to slow down. He had to pay. He's like, okay, let's not do certain attacks as, as strong as they could. Um, <laughs> there were some times when they were <laughs> rolled bad across the line, and then were repulsed and attacked. Um, but then they managed to to work on the flanks. Definitely pay attention to this this woods here. Um, you do not want the allies coming through here. So if you penetrate too quick, too fast with the French and, and get cavalry way out here, you got to watch out because after the first turn reinforcements come here, they get reinforcements on turn three and four here, and you potentially can get yourself surrounded. Uh, you know, if, if the... Anglo allies are forming a pocket sort of around Cotabra and you're trying to come up around it, you know, they, they may be able to get their cavalry around the back or something coming up after turn four. Um, one, two, three, four. So after the first or the turn four, four, guys could get up this far, then one, two, three. So they're, they're, they're getting in here. Uh, so just be careful about penetrating too far, too fast, and potentially getting yourself chopped off, but absolutely don't, you know, don't neglect the going through the woods and letting the allies come around and potentially really messing up the French. Now, one thing to note that in the individual units, there's no concept of supply. So the individual units are, are, are fighting. If they get surrounded and they can't retreat, they die, but there's no sense of like cutting off the supply line in the individual scenarios. 
Whereas in the campaign game, if units are put out of supply, you only calculate supply the very first turn of a day, not including the first day. So if we look at the chart here in the campaign game, first day here, 900 hours, and then uh, the very first daylight turn on June uh, 18th. At those days, you have to trace your to your supply sources to see, are my guys cut off from their supply? And if they are, they're just gone. It's like, up oh, those units are assumed to have gone, abandoned, went, you know, gone away because they, they didn't have the supplies. Or they needed, you know, they, they ran off to try to go get themselves back in supplier communication. They were cut off, whatnot. Uh, obviously, the troops could survive <laughs> for a couple of days, even if they're starving or whatnot. So it's not like, oh my God, da -da, they have, and they just instantly, you know, starved and died. It's like, Oh, they've lost effective as a combat unit. They, they're 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 cut off and they're, you know, not necessarily surrendering, but they're like dispersing or disbanding or, or, or heading off somewhere. They've become combat ineffective. Um, so that does not come into play. So so having the Anglo allies penetrate back here, you know, you're, you're not worrying about getting cut off supply per se, but <laughs> coming. Coming up behind you and getting your retreat cut off can be disastrous. Um, if if they get to the right place at the right time, um, so that's something to, to take note of. Um, Cotter Bra, if you remember, is worth one point a turn victory point wise. Each enemy strength point eliminated is worth one point a turn. This is worth five points at the end. One thing that I think maybe, for me, the Anglo allies might have wanted to have abandoned Cotabra maybe a turn early or something. I think with them trying to hold on, uh, they they got themselves in more of a pickle than they should have. And, uh, you know, once they got demoralized and their, their ability, you know, they're not no longer going to be able to force uh, a... Do, do an advance after combat. Uh, so, you know, never be able to, to, to force a surround by a multiple attack where you, you know, push one guy back, advance, cut off someone else and kill them. Uh, it was sort of over. They may have wanted to have backed off a little earlier, given the, what was happening with Ney's push up and, and you know, the, the flanks, um, and then maybe trying to counterattack to take it. Uh, I think, that may have helped them in the long run. Uh, that they 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 may have stood a better chance, and if they could have gotten back into Cotterbra by the end, using their big, you know, strict six strength infantry brigade uh, reinforcements and all their bunches of little ar artillery, and that they might have uh, stood a chance. And and uh... so so that's something to think about. That you don't necessarily have to as the Anglo. Hold Cotterbra to death, you know, <laughs> hold the last man. No, you may want to retreat. You may want to say, hey, I'm going to get back off, maybe try to lure Ney forward, especially if you can do it in such a way where maybe you're keeping him engaged in one spot, sort of getting him to stick his, his nose out, and then you think maybe you can jump in and surround some guys or something. Uh, so that's something to take take note of. Um not not many other comments about the actual play. Part of the problem is I, I don't remember all the details since it was a while ago. Um, and remember, we only played through like six turns and then decided to call it since the Anglo allies had gotten demoralized and they weren't going to be able to to put up a fight worth, worth trying. Um, and, you know, maybe if they had retreated a little earlier, they might have done better and then try to make a, a comeback at that. But that's that's something to think about. Um, so playing the campaign game, again, I'm talking about the command and control, the difference is, you know, so even without Deerlon's first core, Ney, as a leader, only has a one command rating in the command, in the campaign game. That means he can control one core and one other unit. So he's got the third cavalry core and the second infantry core. He's got, uh, a guard's cavalry assigned to him. 
So normally he's going to end up using his independent control for the guards cavalry or one of the cavalry from the third corps, depending. So he can keep all of, you know, second corps as long as they're within the right radius. So you're not going to be able to spread out as much with the French and attack on multiple flanks. You're going to have to maybe attack on one flank in the center and that's it. And maybe on one turn you can, you know, can switch depending on where Ney is. He might move slightly back and forth, but you can't attack <laughs> on such a broad front in the campaign game with just Ney. And so like Day or Lon's core, a whole other core, it's almost, almost useless other than the fact like, well, you can have, you know, one core going one way, one the other, and then, you know, the potential to like, well, switch between this turn, this whole core will attack, and maybe this one, that whole turn will attack. And again, in the campaign game, demoralization is by core. So like if you lose some demoralization here and some over there, you sort of spread it around. It can help, but it's no, the Deerlon's core in the folio game, the standalone scenario would be awesome. I mean, so many extra troops are just, there'd be no problem of steamrolling uh, Wellington's forces at Cotabra if you had in 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 the folio game the scenario separate scenario all those troops so things are also quite different if you play Leany as a scenario again I still think it's worth it playing the individual cam the individual scenarios by themselves as the standalone scenarios to get used to the system and then before you play the campaign game use the campaign rules for command and control and play this game, this scenario, and play Leany. Just use, you know, adding in the command and control you and, and get used to it. When you play the campaign game, then you'll see like, oh man, maybe I want to <laughs> have Ney join Napoleon at Leany, do a swap, and then bring Grouchy over here who can control two cores and two independents. And he should have a much better time. Or you could say, hey, I'm going to bring in Napoleon this way. Try to get him in between the Prussians. A lot of times in the campaign, the, the Prussians want to make a beeline up this road and try to get together. And if they can fight a skillful fighting withdrawal way over here, they can protect their supply line and potentially try to team up. But it's it's kind of difficult. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that now. That'll be for future future things, but we're going to call it quits here. I got to, I actually got to go do a, a, a Skype call, but, um, so to all, all you folks that enjoyed those playthroughs, I will try to do another one at some point, uh, using one of the other versions, like the decision games version. And I will try to do one of these showing it with the, the campaign command and controller to show how different it is. But uh, not sure when that'll be. That'll probably be in the second half of this year. Got a lot of stuff going up to the to summertime, and then then we'll see. But uh, that's Meandering Mike, Man Cave of Madness. This was our after action review of Cotter Bra, discussion of our play, and various stuff about the difference between the, the standalone scenario and the campaign game. So, to all you good folks out there, take care and ciao.